Hallelujah. I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only Son, a prophet and Savior of the world, that there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only Son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God, is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you, and God be glorified. As we move forward to conclude the matter of I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Jesus Christ series, we'll be now dealing with the fifth of these uh, sermons, and I trust God that you can get what God wants you to have out of them. Let's go into your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. We'll use our anchor verse as our theme verse. And that's Romans chapter 1 verse 6. As Paul was telling the Romans, he said it this way. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm going to read it one more time. This is Paul talking to the Romans. He said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now here we note that the gospel of Christ is the gospel of grace. So when Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he's saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of grace. And by saying that, Paul was opening up another door. Now, go in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter uh, 28. Proverbs chapter 28, we'll read verse 1. The supplicant scripture that will follow will be Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. And as we read in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1, when you got it, just kind of say, I got it. Hallelujah. The Word of God reads, and it says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as lions. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as as lion. Deuteronomy 31 and 6 says, be strong, be bold. Now the word what you're reading says, be courageous, but the word courageous means be bold. So Deuteronomy 31 and 6 says, be strong, be bold. Don't be afraid or frightened for of them, for the Lord thy God, he it is that does go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsaken thee. So here, I'm going to use for a text this morning. Be bold and not ashamed. Subtext, two kingdoms, who you with. Two kingdoms, who you with. And for those that are a student in the English language, who are you with? But who you with? Two kingdoms. You're with one or the other. You've decided to be with one or the other. You made a decision to either be with Christ or not to be with Christ. We're in a time now where people are choosing to be silent when they should be speaking. We're in a season now where people are afraid to be bold. They're not even sure what the word bold mean. They don't know how to be bold. They, they've come to the fact where they're so concerned about their peers. They're so concerned about what people think about them. They're so concerned about trying to get in to fit in until when it's really time to be bold for God, they're silent. They want to be a part of the clique. They don't want people to dislike them. They do know right from wrong. They know the difference between truth and a lie. They know the difference between going to heaven and going to hell. They do know right from wrong, but they have decided to be silent 
because they're afraid to be bold. You see, to be bold means to not hesitate. It is not hesitation, it's nor fearful in the face of actual or possible danger. To be bold means to not to be afraid to be rebuffed. Not to be afraid to be rebuffed. It means to be courageous and daring. To be bold means to step out in the face of opposition. To truly be bold, you must not hesitate to tell the world about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're living a season now where Christians have compromised so much that even while compromising, we don't even realize, some of us don't realize that we've compromised. We have went along so long until we think when we say Jesus that they're going to look at me funny. Where they're supposed to look at you funny. You're different. You're different from the world. The sad truth is today that most believers don't want to be different, but you are different. Your walk is different. Your talk is different. The way you carry yourself should be different. Don't be afraid to be different because that's what it's all about. We are light and they are darkness. That's different. We are sought to preserve them. That's different. We're not supposed to be hiding because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And we have the church today. Everybody's compromising. And everybody's come out the closet but the church. So your assignment until Jesus return is to be bold. And not only bold, but not ashamed. Now the word not ashamed means not to be embarrassed. Are you embarrassed because you saved? Are you afraid to tell someone about Jesus because you're worried about what they're going to say? Do you get embarrassed when you pray in public at a restaurant? Do you feel like that I shouldn't do this? When someone starts talking about Jesus Christ, are you the one that hope they be quiet? Are you the one that when you're around other Christians, you don't want to let nobody know, so when they bring up Jesus, you're looking at them all crazy? Like, what you talking about Jesus for in here? I'm working out. I'm at work. Did you not know that everywhere you go, Jesus is supposed to go with you? You carry him on the inside. You ain't the light. He's the light. The scripture said, let your light so shine. So it ain't about you. It's the light that's within you. Don't turn off the switch because you're around other folks. Don't try to get along with folks and you turn off Jesus. His light needs to resident to your heart. And people will see his light in your eyes. They will see the manifestation of his light in your conversation. They will hear how you talk. They will know you have the character of God, which is the fruit of the Spirit. They know that you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance, gentleness, faith. They'll know it when your lights are on. If your lights are not on, it's kind of hard to be bold when you know you're not really representing Yeshua. So to be truly bold, I must not hesitate. Now what does that mean? To not hesitate simply means that I must engage in confrontation. I can't be ashamed. I can't allow myself to be regretful. Your boss needs you to pray for him, but... You're looking around to see who's looking. A shame also means a feeling of disgrace. Are you feeling disgrace or dishonor because you have Jesus? You know what he said? He said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you in the day of my father. So if, if you're dishonoring him, you're not going to be honored in the day of his father. We have believers that are afraid. I haven't seen so many timid believers in my whole life. I can't believe how so many believers got all this power, all of this Holy Ghost in you, but you're afraid. You become intimidated. A witch can come sit beside you and you shutting up 
You won't speak in tongues. You know, afraid, intimidated. That is not what God wants us to be. He wants us to have power, and you got the power. The power of God resides in you. Can everybody say, I have the power? I have the power. Say, I have the power in me. The power is really is in you. You got the power. You should not be ashamed. Of what? You're going to be ashamed of the one that brought you out? Ashamed of the one that healed your body? Ashamed of the one that delivered you? Ashamed of the one that's given you everything you got? If anybody going to be ashamed, it should not be believers. We was on our way to a devil's hell. But now we're on our way to a God's heaven. We should never be ashamed, be it with your co-workers, be it with your so-called friends, be it with your spouse. If you got a spouse that's, not a, that's ashamed, you got a problem. As kingdom citizens, we should never be ashamed. Will the church say amen? amen? We must be bold because the kingdom of Satan is very bold. How many of you know that the devil ain't playing? I can recall years ago that you only saw scary movies during the month of October. Now you can see them every day of the week and of the year. The devil bold. I can recall years ago, homosexuals would never come out the closet. Now there is no closet, they're everywhere. They have a bold, proud spirit. I can recall that our children would be respectful to their mother and their father. But now they're boldly cussing them out in public, boldly talking crazy to teachers, boldly slapping and punching teachers, boldly cussing out principals and superintendents, boldly are going against the law, boldly causing problems at school and at, in our community. They're doing it boldly. There's a private anger. There's a private frustration. There's a private indignation with our young people. They've come to the conclusion that nobody cares about me. So therefore, they're wearing their parents low. They're sagging and dragging. They're doing things to let you know, here is how I feel about you. And when you look at them, they show you they're behind. They show you they're behind. They talk to you like you are nothing. Because they feel that you wasn't bold enough to tell them the truth when they needed to hear the truth. You wasn't bold enough to say you're not going out tonight. You wasn't bold enough to say that person don't mean you any good. You wasn't bold enough to give them what they need. But they are bold enough to say, shut up, I don't want to hear what you got to say. They are bold enough to confront you. Why? Because they're angry. We're living in a culture now where our young people are angry. They're frustrated. They're waiting on you, church, somebody to tell them that they're doing wrong, somebody to encourage them to do right. That's the culture that we're in. So let us not get so upset when you got cops putting sticks upside your son and your daughter's head. Let us not get frustrated with that. If the cop says, get out the car, the young person needs to get out the car. If the cop says, put your hands up, the young person needs to put their hands up. If the cop says, get off the street, the young person needs to get off the street. But the reason why a lot of our youth don't obey the cops is because they don't obey their parents. The mother and father got to tell them five times to do something. Well, the cops ain't going to tell you five times to do it. Mother and father got to wrestle with you. Mother and father got to beg you. In the real world, they don't do that. They're fighting for their lives. So parents, be bold with your children. Don't compromise with them. They don't need your compromise. Be bold with your children. Don't try to be their friends. Be bold with your children. Don't try to 
Go along to get along so, you, so they can like you. Be bold with your children. If we're going to be bold for souls, I got to first be bold for the souls that's in my house. Will the church say amen? amen. If you know I'm right about to give God a hand and praise in the house of God. We want to tell the police officer what to do when you're not in their condition or their position. There's a training film that I've seen years ago called Shoot, Don't Shoot. Had an eight-year-old riding on his bicycle with a nine-millimeter in a basket, roll up on one of the cops in one of the major cities. And before the cop realized that the young man had the ups on him, had a gun on him. Now that the cop had to decide, do I kill this child or do I not? By the time the child had the gun in front of him, the question was, shoot, don't shoot. Now, most law enforcement, the moment he pulled a weapon out, they would have killed him on the spot. So is it society or is it our homes? Is it, is it little Flip, little Ricky? Is it little Shanene that won't listen to nobody? Is it little Butch? Is it the crackhead father that's not taking care of his kid? Or is it the, the woman that's hoarding around with everybody she can find and not teaching her daughter how to respect law? Not teaching her daughter how to respect a man. Daughters cussing boys out. Calling young men bees and hoes in their face. In the school, in the classroom. And we got parents coming up to the school trying to get back at the teachers. Fussing at the teachers for what they won't do with their child at home. Well, somebody said, we got to be bold. See, before we can go out to the street and be bold, you need to make sure your house is right. You got little Willie running around robbing folks and you trying to witness somebody. Can somebody tell me we need to get little Willie? Somebody say amen. amen. You trying to get everybody else saved while the people in your family going to hell. <laughs> they going to hell. Your daughter don't know how to act. Your son don't know how to act. But we expect law enforcement to do the work that we should have done with our kids at home. Will the church say amen? amen. So we got to be bold at home. Why your son cussing you out in your house? Why your daughter switching her little nasty self all around, trying to deal with grown men and she's 13 years old in your house? We want to win the world, but how about winning your house? We can take this thing over. If all the fathers just go out and snatch them sons up, them mothers go out and snatch them daughters up and say, come hell or high water, you're going to know how to act on my watch. Will the church say amen? amen? So we can't talk about being bold to win the world when your children acting a fool. How are you going to be bold for souls when you're not trying to be bold with the souls you got right at home? You got to decide that you're going to be bold for Christ and not ashamed. Can somebody say, I'm not ashamed? Not ashamed. Now, that just can't be lip service. It can't be expensive rhetoric, nice sounding cotton candy uh, words. It's got to have something to it. it. It just can't be, ooh, look at what I'm saying. We must be bold because of the kingdom of God. We must be bold to advance the kingdom of God. We can no longer look back and, and see the devil winning everybody and all we do is cheerlead and say, hey, they got all the tattoos on, look at them. You know, really living in sin, they really got it bad. We can't do that. We can't sit back and point the fingers and say, hey, look at how bad the world is when you're supposed to be sought in light. If you're sought in light, you're supposed to be affecting the world in which you live. Will the church say Amen. Let us consider five things I want to give to you real quick. Number one, your boldness will let people know you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. You can't tell me you're bold and don't nobody know that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. So if you're really bold, your boldness will let people know that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. The Word of God tells us in 
Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. See, when you bowl, people will know that you've been with Jesus. When you bowl, people will have a certain expectation that you're not like everybody else. When you're bold, you go up to them without hesitation. You say, do you know God loves you? Do you know that God has a plan for your life? Do you know that God wants you to be in heaven? God is not mad at you. You got to have the grace to be bold. You got to have the grace to love people. I'm going to suggest to you that there is no boldness until you know without a shadow of a doubt that it was God's grace and his mercy and his love that drew you in. When you know that, you'll be bold for souls. Will the church say amen? If you got Jesus, you got to be bold. There's no such thing as saying, I got the Lord, but I'm not bold. That's an illusion. You're deceiving yourself. How are you going to tell me you saved, but you never won anyone to Christ? I'm saved. How long have you been saved? Oh, about 10 years. How many people have you won to Christ? Uh, I think probably about one or two. You're under a delusion. You're deceiving yourself. It's called self-deception. Who have you won for Christ? Who have you said, will you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And you read it through them. Who are you really winning? When you bold, that's what bold people do. When you know Christ, you want everybody else to know him. When you know what he's done for you, when you know how far he's brought you, when you know that he's healed your body, when you know that he's delivered you, when you know this, you want to share that with the world. It's not a secret that Jesus saved. Will the church say Jesus saved? And he want to save everyone else. There's no such thing as that I got Jesus, but I'm not bold. That's self-deception. How are you going to have Jesus and you're not bold? You're passing by people that you're supposed to be trying to reach. You walk in the street, but too proud, too arrogant, too selfish to tell somebody about the most powerful experience that you've ever had. Oh, you think the blind eyes coming open is the miracle. You think the deaf hearing is the miracle. The lame walking is the miracle. You think the maimed arms being stretched out is the miracle. You even think the dead being raised is the most powerful miracle. But the most powerful miracle that you could ever get is the miracle of salvation. When you accept Yeshua as your personal Savior, that is the most powerful miracle. Why? Because through your salvation, all the others follow. Without Christ, their blind eyes cannot come open. Without Christ, the deaf can never hear. Without Christ, the lame can never walk. Without Christ, the blind can never see. Without Christ, the dead can never be raised. So the greatest miracle that you've experienced is the miracle of salvation where God is now in your life and he wants you to take your experience to the world so the world may know that Jesus Christ saves. But you got to be bold to do that. You don't need a hundred people walking with you being bold to do that. You need to do it yourself. Each one Reach one. Are you bold? If you got Jesus, you got to be bold. In order to win the war of the optics, that is what people see you do. Are you winning the optic war? Or are you losing? When people look at you, do they see you winning or are you losing? Are you losing the optic war? Are you? Because if you're losing the optic war, then that means that people don't see you as a bold soldier. 
I can tell you a group right now that's not losing the optic war. And they are called the Jehovah's Witness. They're winning the optic war. The word optic means observation, what you see, what the eyes see. They're winning it because when people see them, they see them doing the work, not talking about it. When they see them, they see them knocking on doors, not saying one of these days we're going to do it. When they see them, they see them in the community. You may say, well, you know, they got the wrong word. If they got the wrong word and we believe they do, they're definitely giving us an example of how to do what they do. The Christian church is asleep. We're waiting on things. When am I going to get my car? When am I going to get my house? When am I going to get my suit? When am I going to get my shoes? When am I going to hit the big one? When is the money coming? What am I going to do while everybody going to hell? The worst thing you could have done in church was got saved. And then get saved and do nothing with what you have. You have the most powerful, awesome being on the planet. He has the whole universe in a span. And he's your daddy. And he said, I need you to go out and win the loss. I need you to colonize until I come. I need you to be busy doing the kingdom work. So who's winning the optics? Are you or is it the devil? You can see the devil on Sunday mornings now. He's on every channel. They got demons that looking, looking like beautiful young models, witches everywhere. Our young children, if they're not getting a word from you or from the church, they're going to be messed up because they got witches looking good. I mean, evil just look good today. And we got Christians sitting back watching that garbage in their house with the children but won't say that's from the pit of hell. Sit back and watch it. You got your kids watching all kind of garbage. Demons and warlocks, witches and everything else. Why? The devil is bold. He's bold. While Christians are quiet. Look to your neighbor and say, and the devil is alive. We got to step up and come out of the surrender mode and go on offensive mode. Number two, the Holy Ghost will cause you to speak the word of God with boldness. You can't tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you timid. You can't tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you lazy. You can't tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you slothful. That is not the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. You can't tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you're intimidated by the world. The Holy Spirit get ignited when he gets in the world. Fact about it, the Holy Spirit performs best when he's in the world. Well, you jump and shout in church, but can you do it at work? You jump and shout at church, you hot ta ta in the Honda at church. You're talking about Jesus at church, but can you do it on the block? Can you do it on the block? Can you really be a good, strong Christian in your neighborhood? Do they really know you? Or do they see a person that's trying to be what he's not? What he's not? Do, they really, do they see your love? Do they feel your love? When you're around people that are not believers, do they feel your love? Do they feel it? Or are you apprehensive? Apprehensive. I don't want to talk to them. I'm special. But if you're a kingdom citizen, you're a believer, you must be bold. That means not to hesitate. Good morning, sir. What is your name? It's really good to see you today. How are you doing today? I just want to ask you one question. I always say one question. Can I get one question? After you got a minute, can I get one question? I just need one question. You got a minute? Can everybody say you got a minute? That's all you got to need. All you need is a minute. Got a minute? I just need to ask you one question. I just need to ask you one question. 
And that question is, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? We have to engage the community. We have to engage people. We can't just sit back and say, well, I ain't going to go to nobody until they come to me. If we do that, nobody will be saved. That's a proud, arrogant spirit. But the Holy Ghost will cause you to speak the word of God with boldness. Acts chapter 4, verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. The Holy Spirit is not a pacifist. He's not a pacifist that's uh, just sitting back and, you know, sucking on his thumb. The Holy Spirit is not a pacifist. You can't tell me you got the Holy Ghost and you're not bold. That's an oxymoron. That doesn't make sense. I got the power of God. I got the Holy Spirit, but I'm not bold. It's no such thing. And you got the Holy Spirit because you're saved. The moment you got saved, you received the Numa Hagion. The power of the Holy Ghost that never ever runs out. He's in you. He's guiding you. He's leading you. And he's ready to go to work. The Holy Spirit doesn't get any fulfillment by being in the church around a bunch of so-called saved folks. You're not going to see the real power of the Holy Ghost until you hit these streets. You're thinking you're seeing it, but you're not. All you're doing is allowing the Holy Spirit to discern one another, to try to see where each other is at. But his best work is in the comeback zone. His best work is in the war zone. He does his best work in the war zone. Wherever Jesus went, the Holy Spirit was with him. You look at the apostles, Peter, James, John, Paul, you look at all of them. They had the Holy Spirit, and wherever they went, they was bold. Bold! They wasn't running. Man had a demon. They went to him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such that I have, rise up and walk. They were bold. You got to be willing to be bold, church. We must be bold to tell the world that Jesus is coming soon. How many of you believe that he's coming soon? See, if you got that thing in you, you should feel that clock ticking. Y'all don't want to say nothing to me. If you got that thing in you, you should feel that clock ticking. And the more that clock tick, your body and your mind, everything about you, is the alarm would go off in your heart to know that Jesus is coming soon. He's coming soon. The Bible said, no man knows the day nor the hour which comes the Son of Man. The only one that knows when Yeshua is to return is God himself. Even the angels don't know when he's coming. But he put that thing in you, that, that eternal clock, to let you know that as you see the world, you can know that something is getting ready to happen. There's too much going on where something is about to happen. Something is getting ready to take place. How many of you got that intuition where you know that when something ain't right, you can just kind of sense something is about to take place? If you ever been at a club or, or you ever been at a, at a situation and you were just in the place, you didn't know what it was, but you just said something don't feel right. There are thousands upon thousands and some millions of believers that are in this world that are saying something just doesn't feel right. Something, something is about to happen. You can sense it. You can feel it. When you're seeing grown men walking down the aisle to get married and tongue kissing one another, you can sense it. Something is about to happen. You can sense when grown men would rather sleep with two-year-old than to sleep with a full-grown woman. You can sense something is about to happen. When witches are out the closet and demons are walking the streets and zombies and mumbies are everywhere, you can sense something is about to happen. When the church has become so compromising where she refused to speak truth to power, we know something is about to happen. 
when our children do not want to follow the rules of the house and the parents don't want to follow the rules of society, we know that something is about to happen. When our city officials and our congressmen and senators are so, are so docile and wrapped up in their political parties that can't sense the urgency of now, we as believers have to know something is about to happen. Can you sense it? Can you see it? Can you hear it? It's not like I got to sense it all the time. The devil is so bold that he put the mess right in our face. It kind of reminds me of David and Goliath. One thing about the devil, he's bold. When Goliath was saying, send me a man that can come out and fight against me. And what the world is telling the church, send me a believer that's going to come out and say homosexuality is wrong. Send me a believer that's going to come out and say same-sex marriage is wrong. Send me a believer that's going to talk about witchcraft. Send me a believer that's going to talk about all this filth we're doing. The world is saying, where is David today? Goliath is tormenting the church. And we have a lot of these proud cowards. All they want to do is preach and teach, but they don't want to go into the culture and change the culture by being bold. I'm talking to folks that I hope and pray that you're getting the spirit of your pastor. You got to be bold today. You cannot lay down. The world needs to know that Jesus is soon to come. And he's coming on your watch. You got to decide to be bold. You're not going to get an option or, ooh, just feel like that. If you got Christ, you got to be bold. It's no such thing that I got Jesus, but I'm afraid. It's no such thing I got Jesus, but I don't want them to hurt me. If you're not really, if you're not ready to die, why are you in Christ? Oh, you thought you just signed up for something to be cute and pretty? Are you on a death mission? He tells you got to die to yourself. And when you hit these streets, you better already be dead because if you're already dead, you ain't got to worry about nobody trying to kill you. You got to be ready to go. What does that mean? That means that for God I live, for God I die. Now that sounds like a cute phrase, but you better understand it. You get out there in the wrong place and you ain't ready to leave here. You need to stay at home and blow them bubbles at home. You get out on the street, you don't know what the devil got for you. Will the church say amen? amen. You got to make it up in your mind, for God I live, for God I die from the womb to the tomb. I'm in it and going to stay in it to win it. It's not about mediocrity. It's about being a soldier. You got to be bold. How many people would have got saved if you had just asked the question? Got a minute? Can I say got a minute? All you got to do is say got a minute. Uh, all I need is one question. Matter of fact, I really don't need a minute. Can I ask you this one question? Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him as your personal Savior? But see, sometimes we don't want to do that because we want to be cute. Number three. Your boldness will cause you to engage your community for the kingdom of God. You can't tell me you got Jesus and you're not trying to change your community. And we got some pastors now that have finally figured that out, that uh, I, I, I can't change policy until I change politicians. They're finally beginning to figure out that I can't change the law until we get somebody else up in there that are of, that are of the kingdom of God. See, to change the, to change the world system, we got to get in that system and then work from within to out. You can march until Jesus returns. As long as you got a wicked Pharaoh in office, ain't nothing changing. We done marched around the world. If we take all the marches we done had, we done marched all around the world at least four or five times. And ain't nothing changed. 
The only thing that's consistent in life is change. So you would think that we would have figured it out by now that if we're going to change it, we got to work in it to make the effective change. But these kingdom citizens, they want to be friends with the world, don't want to engage the world. Personally, I love confrontation. I think strong people endure confrontation. Weak people, as soon as you say something to hurt their feeling, they go over to a corner and start crying. You hurt my feelings. Why? Because they said something that you didn't like. You said, well, I like grapes. And they said, I don't like grapes. They taste nasty. I like plums. And you with your silly self go to the corner. I don't like it because she says she don't like grapes. She don't like the grapes. She don't like the grapes and that hurt my feelings. Just weak. You need to be like your pastor. You don't like grapes. I love grapes. You ain't got to ever put a grape in your mouth forever. I'm going to eat my grapes right here in front of you. Bump you. Fact about it, I'm glad you don't like grapes so I can eat them all up. Our children are afraid of confrontation. Adults are afraid of confrontation. When you have confrontation, that's good for you. It shows you how to be an individual. It shows you how to be strong. It shows you how to be bold. And years ago, they used to talk about playing the dozen. Today, you play the dozen, people want to shoot you. But back then, you talk about my mama, I'm talking about your mama. And we just talk about each other's mama all day long. And, and when you got to talking about each other's mama, say, hey, man, I'm sorry. All right, man, it's all good. Today, our young people don't know how to play the dozen. They're weak. They're weak. As soon as you say something to hurt their feelings, they're crying. Why you don't like me? I thought you was my bestest friend. Ain't nobody going to always like you. Well, I would go out, but I don't like Mary. Why? Because I had my bestest dress on and she didn't say a word. She didn't say a word. How I many you know that when you look good, I don't even say what you want. You ain't got to ever tell me because I, hey, listen here, what up? Talk to me. <laughs> my self-esteem is intact. If nothing else ain't intact, I know God loved me and check it out. I love me. Everything else don't matter. Are you with me in the house? Amen. Look to your neighbor and say, I know God love me. And I love me. Everything else don't matter. It, it really don't matter because, and the reason why it don't matter because people will know you got it going on but won't tell you. You better love yourself and be bold. Go to Acts chapter 19 verse 8. I don't want my grandkids running around here crying because she didn't want to be my friend. You need to clap your hand, baby, say, thank you, Jesus. I didn't like her anyway. Somebody say amen. Ain't nobody begging for no friends today. Those days are over. Why won't she call me back? Why won't he call me back? Okay, that's probably God saying that person shouldn't be in your life anyway. Have you ever noticed that sometimes people that are not in your life, you look back on it and you, and you, and you do an urkel and you say, was I friends with that? <laughs> you get mad at yourself for allowing yourself to even think about being friends with somebody like that. Be bold. So Acts chapter 19 verse 8 it says, and he went into the synagogue and spake what? Boldly for the space of what? Three months disputing and persuading. Can everybody say disputing and persuading? Come on, say it loud, church. This confrontation. Say it, disputing and persuading. Disputing and persuasion. That's confrontation. Per disputing and persuading. That's what the church had to do with the world. They're not going to agree with us all the time, but we can have disputes and we can persuade. How do we persuade? We persuade by what we know. We have to go to the world with the assumption that they don't know what we know. If they're not saved, we have what they need. If they're not saved, 
we go out and engage. What I have, you need. I come to offer you Jesus Christ. And if you accept him as your personal savior, you'll be able to receive these benefits. But you have to want to do that, church. It, it, it just doesn't happen by osmosis. Remember, they did it for three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. If we would just do that verse right there, that's boldness wrapped up in one package. Disputing and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. We know everybody's not going to be saved. At least I know it. Jesus didn't save everybody. But he died on the cross for those that want to be saved. How many caught that? See, his death, his burial, and his resurrection is your first class ticket to heaven. If you want it. If you don't want it, you, you're sending yourself to hell. You got to want it. It's a choice. I love it when he gives us choices. So you can't be at judgment and say, well, Jesus, I would have got saved, but uh, you made it so that I couldn't. He said, no, you had a choice. None of us can say that he intentionally wanted us to go to hell. The scripture says that he would, that none would perish and that all would have eternal life. And and the only difference in that is that, who are you telling that to? See, the world don't know they already have the invitation. The scripture record that everyone that was sent on assignment to the earth already had the invitation to go back. How many caught that? See, they were sent. See, you thought you was born out of your mama. You thought your daddy just released you into your mother's womb. You went into a nine-month metamorphosis, being colonized in your mother's belly while germinating with your father's semen. You thought that just by you coming out of your mother's womb that that was it. You thought that since you was born in the world that, well, what am I supposed to do? No, before you was in your mother's womb, as Jeremiah 1 and 5 tells us, I knew thee. You see, God has assigned you before he released you. You already had purpose before he released you. So, so he assigned you, wrote your name up in the book of life and said, I holler back when you get back. So he sent you on a mission. Your mission is to colonize the world until Yeshua returns. So he sent you down here to do the work of the kingdom. So if you're going to do the work of the kingdom, you got to be bold. I've never seen no warriors talking about, hey, don't touch me. No, 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 no. A warrior got to be bold. So he sent you to the earth. He said, go down there and colonize. Now, now, doesn't that just kind of blows your mind that if, if you get past all of your stuff, if you get past all of your stuff to know that he loved you enough to send you here to do the work of the kingdom. Oh, your mama didn't have nothing to do with it by you getting here. There is no such thing as an accidental, uh, oops, she's pregnant. No, no, no. No such thing as accidental pregnancy. No such thing as that I wasn't planned. Your mama didn't plan you, but God did. There's no such thing as that, you know, I'm just here by accident. No, no, no. God planned you. He sent you here. Your mama tried to abort you. Your daddy won't take care of you. People lied on you, but God said, you are here because I want you here. Now be bold for the kingdom of God. So the enemy's job is to twist it. He, he, he to get you looking at other things. This is why it's so important for parents to be godly. Because, see, your job is to train them up in the way they should go. Are you with me? If you train them up in the way they should go, and what way is that? To Christ. They need to be bold soldiers. 
So parents, your job is to equip them to be fit for the kingdom. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. Your job is to equip them to be ready for demons, warlock, witches, and, and all that. You got to train them up so they'll know the difference. So when they get older, they won't be spinning out on stupid stuff. Now, what's the devil's job? His job is to throw vices at them. If I can get her hooked on cocaine at 16, she'll spend the next 30 years trying to rediscover herself. If I can get him molested at age six or seven, and now he's going to spend the rest of his life wondering, am I man or am I woman? You see, the enemy is crafty, and he uses vices to send us on social, mental, and psychological decoys where we spend the rest of our lives trying to get back to what God has purpose for us to be. And we find ourselves wrestling with ourselves when that was never God's design. It was never his design. He purposed you, but your mama was a whore. He purposed you, but your daddy was an alcoholic. He purposed you, but all your friends around you was living in mess. And you got raised in that mess. And now you are a mess. But how many of you know that God specializes in turning messes into messages. He specializes in, in redirection. Can everybody say redirect? See, he corrects and then redirect. Uh -huh, the devil thought he had to, but see now, he, he thought he had to, but he thought he had you on lockdown because maybe mama wasn't there, father wasn't there, all hell came through your life and you found yourself, what am I going to do? I don't know what I'm going to do. And God says, I put that thing in you, I got you, and all you got to do is know that he, from the foundation of the earth, he born you to do great things. But the devil wants you chasing decoys. He throw, he says, take this nice, shiny, pretty thing. You know, nice, shiny, pretty thing. Then say, so you like sweets. Take this little cotton candy. And all of these are poison to the soul because he knows that if he can get you hooked early, maybe raped early. Stay with me now. Now you running around, got it too tight, got it too low, got it too high. And your whole life is wrapped around being a victim. Have you ever asked yourself the question, who am I before whatever happens to me? Uh-oh. <laughs> who are you before you got raped? Who are you before you got molested? Who are you before you start spinning out doing crazy things? Who are you before you start doing drugs? Who are you? I'm here to suggest to you that the you that you was before you start getting caught up in vices was the same you that God released into your mother's womb. The enemy wants you to start it. He wants you to chase decoys for the rest of your life. You 99 years old talking about, I'm just hurt because of what my mama did. I'm upset because of what happened to me at six. But see, the devil don't want you to get this here because once you get this, you're going to flip it on him. Can everybody say, I got to flip it on him. See, you got to ask, who, who are you telling about your story. Oh, he hates that. Because when you tell your story, you release yourself. When you tell your story, the devil now knows that what he meant for bad, God is now using for good. I say, church, be bold. You got to be bold. It's okay to say I was on my way to a devil's hell. It's okay to say I was blind, but now I see. It's okay to say I didn't know how we are going to eat. We're living in an outhouse. I didn't know what's going to You got to be bold, be bold, be bold. Know that whatever you're going through, somebody has already been through it. Be bold. Why do I, why do I have to be bold? Because I'm trying to win some souls. I can't be bold if, if I'm not winning souls because, see, See, he has tricked you to think that it's always about you. It's, it's, it's me. It's me. And, and if it's always about you, you have your salvation in the box. 
What can I get for me? When salvation has never been meant to be in the box. Salvation is always meant to be, what can I give to others? But you can't engage if you don't have that mindset. Are you bold? Are you bold? That's why it's good to have uh, young people to have experience because when they're really under 25, they're kind of crazy anyway. And they're, they're so bold when you put the right stuff in them, they're, they'll walk up to anybody. Young folks ain't got no shame. They're bold. All they need to do is just be sent on a mission. We need you to do this and do that and report back in two hours. Meet us over here. You got them at concerts right now. They're going to rock concerts. They're going to these concerts with Jesus sign on their boat. They ain't got no sense. They just, hey, have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior? Them demons looking at them like, oh, what you doing up in here? <laughs> and the thing about it, the young people don't get upset. They just, if they say no, they say, okay, well, thank you. Have a good day. And they walk, have you? You know, smiling. Have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior? They're young. They don't have them vices that older people have. That's why we have to train them when they're young. They'll do it. They will do it. There are thousands of them out there doing it right now. They will do it. They will show up and ask the question. But why would they do it? They'll do it if their mother and their father and those that are over them to tell them, this is how you do it. And when they see you doing it, they'll want to do it even more. Look to your neighbor and say, I got to be bold. Number four, if you really know Jesus, you got to be bold. Ephesians 3 and 12. It says, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in him. Boldness comes from a knowing of Jesus Christ. Through the knowing, we come to have faith in him. Through faith, we come to be confident, therefore causing us to be bold. So the more I know about him, then the more bold I can talk about him. It's kind of like a salesman trying to sell a product that he don't know nothing about. But how many of you can sell yourself? I hope you know enough about yourself where you can talk to people about you in a more confident manner. I hope you're not introducing yourself to people and say, hey, my name is Rick and I'm trying to be slick. I hope that you're introducing yourself in a way where people can say, hey, this is a good guy. Being bold means that I know him. I don't know of him. I know him. Through faith. So a lot of times, believers may not be bold like they need to be because they have no real relationship with him. And if there's no real relationship with him, it's hard to be bold about something that you don't know. Amen? Hallelujah. And the last one. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, you will have the power to be bold. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, you will have the power to be bold. Now what does that mean? That means speaking in tongues. Whenever I go out and make any decision, I always make a decision based upon uh, speaking in tongues. I talk to God in tongues. I, I want to know that I'm out the way and that the Holy Spirit is leading the way. When we go to these shopping malls, when we go to these other areas, you got to go with boldness. You can't go being scared. You can't go thinking it's all about you. Look at me. Don't I look pretty in my shirt? Don't I look pretty? You know, you can't go with that attitude. You have to go with the attitude that I'm representing Christ, the attitude that I'm being bold for souls, the attitude that uh, I love God and I know God loves me and I want you to have the same experience that I'm having with God. You have to decide to be bold. It just doesn't happen. You, you know, you don't, you don't get these mystical thoughts. 
You have to decide that since I have the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be bold for souls. And then more than that, you have to want to. Amen? Ephesians 6, verse 18 through 20 says this. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Verse 19, it says, And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, and I am an ambassador, open my mouth boldly, to make known the mysteries of the gospel. Verse 20, For which I am an ambassador in bond, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now the word ought there simply means that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be bold. You got to decide to be bold. And I know today, if, if we look at our teenagers today, they're hit with everything. I'm, I'm so glad I'm not a teenager. But they were born for this time. See, I was born in, this, in 1956. I was born for civil rights. And I believe I've kept my mantle of civil rights and social justice. I've been doing it all my life. My son and my daughter were born in two different periods, but linked close, which is the time right now. He was born in 75. My daughter was born, in, I believe, in 83. All of this is right now. They're linked in the battle. My granddaughter was born in a time where technology is in full swing. My grandson... The same thing. They're linked together. So if they link together in the socialist conscious of America, why can't they fight together? The devil don't want us fighting together because he wants us looking at different periods. But you was born for such a mess just like this. This is your mess. You was born for it. If you was born after 1960, this is your stuff. You was allowed to be born for such a time as this. And you got to be bold. Come on, stand to your feet and give God a hand and pray. You got to be bold. You see, the Holy Spirit will give you the boldness you need in order to do the work of God. The world needs to hear from you, church. The world need to hear that not only you are bold, but you got something in you to be bold about. And I want you to take this message today as we conclude this matter. That I'm going to be bold for souls. I'm going to tell the world that Jesus is coming. And when your sons and your daughters want to go witness or want to talk to somebody about Jesus. And you say, well, I'm too tired. We'll do it next time. Whenever your kids want to go witness, I don't care if you're sick, you better get up and take them because that ain't the kids that's asking. That's the God in them that's asking. They got to be bold. Look at little Maya and Jonah and Matarina. All these little kids. What messages are you sending them? Are you slothful? Are you lazy? Are you bold? And when we take them to the marketplace, you need to start asking them, you got a minute? You got a minute? All you got to do is say, you got a minute, and just ask one question. Are you saved? See, it, it, it starts with the little ones. So by the time they get 18, 19, Hopefully they ain't leaving the church. You got to train them to be bold, to be strong. Ain't no cowards in this. Ain't no weak people in this. If you're a Christian, how are you going to be a Christian and a coward? 
How are you going to be a Christian and you're afraid? You, you got all Jesus and you're scared. You got the Holy Ghost and you're running. You love the Lord, but you won't tell nobody about it. What I'm doing today, church, is as we close this up, I'm challenging you to be bold. And no, boldness comes when you know him. <laughs> Do you know the man? Because when you know him, it doesn't matter what they say, no matter what they do, you know that he got you. Amen? Come on, give God a hand praise in the house of God.